how are you doing today? This is Mike Reynolds. I'm bringing to you Mike Reynolds Ministries. It's glad to be back with you to talk about this very important subject that we have in subject of race. What I've tried to do is not to address race from the top down, but from the bottom up. Many people talk about race because they just want to settle the problem. They just want to come up with a solution, but they don't understand the roots. They don't understand where it comes from, where the hatred comes from, where the feelings come from. So what we've attempted to do is kind of back up and talk about the history of race and uh, what has kind of brought us to this point and to this time. Now today, in particular, we talked about uh, sociology, we talked about biology. Uh, today in particular, we're going to talk about the history of race and bring you up to date on those issues about uh, the history of race. But before we get started, <clears throat> I'd like to pray with you and ask for God's blessings that God will give us insight into a very sensitive subject so that we can be very keen, wise people in giving answers back to others because we want to be missionaries, evangelists, uh, that can give the truth of the gospel in a way that can be accepted by other people. Let's pray together. Dearly Father, we give you glory and we give you praise. We magnify your most holy name. And God, we ask, Lord, that you'll give us the insight and the wisdom to be not only astute, but to be caring and loving and to present the topics that we're talking about today in a way that will honor the image of God, that will honor what you have created us to be, that will honor you and bring glory to the name of our Father, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, uh, you know, I said that if you all would send in questions that I would respond to them and talk about them. So I have some questions here today and I'd like to, to talk about those questions and I want to encourage you to, please feel free to ask some other questions before next week and I promise to spend some time up front just on those questions and responding to them. My wife gets them together for me. She's my producer. She gets those questions together for me, types them out for me and gets them to me. And so um, please uh, get those messages uh, and uh, get, send us any message you'd like to and we'll make sure we have them and get to you. The, um, <clears throat> the first question that we have today is uh, from uh, Lisa Adams from New Jersey. And Lisa Adams asked this question. Since race doesn't really exist, where did the term come from? Really important question. Well, if you look at a book called Stamp from the Beginning, it shows that people begin to start discussing the issues of race is kind of a, a term to attribute um, the way people looked in the lands they came from instead of just talking about nationality around about the 1400s or so, using it in the way we would use race. But it doesn't become really formalized and used in a way that's connected with a fake science a fake science, uh, it doesn't become more formalized until uh, we get into the uh, 1700s. Then uh, a man uh, both named uh, Boomingbach and a man named uh, Linnaeus uh, gather together uh, and they take each other's writings and they create a position for saying that if uh, plants are a certain way by species, that human are, humans are the same way. What they also did was order an order of the human race and of course placing uh, people who were like them, Europeans, on the top and placing African Americans or people of African descent on the bottom. And then gave characteristics to each one of them, more positive characteristics near the top of the races and more negative characteristics near the bottom of the races. Um, so that's when it comes together as kind of a, a, a way of talking about it, 1700s a way of talking about it as the way we would say it today. Uh, but there is discussion about the issues of um, a race identity that starts about the 13, 1400s. Uh, the second question we have is from Henry of Illinois. And Henry asked the question, uh, how can we begin a discussion with other people about race uh, without getting into an argument? You, you're right, Henry, this is a sensitive subject. First of all, I would always say the thing that we did when we started the show today, <laughs> let's begin it by praying because we need when the subject comes up to pray because we want to be able to make contact with people so they receive what we're saying. Because the last thing we want to do is that people don't receive what we're trying to tell them or what we're trying to talk to them about. Now, the second thing I think that's important is that we use facts. So that's why it's a good thing to watch a show like this so that we can understand and we can engage in facts and not just engage in a sense of just opinions. Opinions make the conversation worse. And then remember, 
The ultimate goal is that we reach somebody and clarify the image of God and clarify the glory that God has made human beings in. So uh, we don't want to get lost in an argument. We don't get lost in an argument about a point. We just want to make sure that we get the clarity that's on the table. Yes, people are sensitive. And uh, there is a book out there called The uh, Frailties of White. Uh, uh, and so you might want to, I might have that name just slightly off, but, but that's a book that you can look up and it helps people uh, learn about how to talk about the subject, which seems so sensitive. Of course, people believe they're going to be called a racist. They believe they're going to be said that they're participating in racism. So they're afraid to enter the conversation. We have to safeguard them from that and let them know they can ask us an innocent question and we won't give them a characterization once they do. Third question I have is from uh, Barbara Ball. Uh, Barbara Ball, Mother Ball, is from Chicago. Mother Ball from Chicago. That's my mother. Uh, well, my spiritual mother, but she really is my mother. And um, um, Mother Ball says this, as a 70 plus senior, I've watched other ethnic groups embrace and try to claim things from the black culture as their own. At the same time, show hate toward blacks. So my question is this, what is uh, in a person or a person's makeup that allows them to love black culture and hate the black as an individual. Um, uh, and so that's the question that we have. Well, mother, this is the answer to such a beautiful question is that one, profound. It's a very deep question. It's a question about uh, cultural relevancy, uh, cultural popularity, and a question also about personal identity. Um, black culture has gone around the world, not just in the United States, but in other countries. Uh, remember, blacks have always been used as a source of entertainment, uh, have always been used as a source of sports. So they have allowed for us to carry identity there while rabbit robbing us from other identities, identities of being intelligent, identities of being uh, people of moral value. And so um, th for people to grab onto our culture is a continuation of that same kind of thinking that there's something um, spectacular, there's something in, uh, uh, shiny, there's something attractable about blacks. And so you can grab onto a few things that they associate with. So playing black music, doing those kinds of things, uh, affirming black sports players, but not necessarily uh, a changing your opinion about how you engage, engage and treat people who are black or who are African-American by descent. So again, um, one of the things you ask at the end, is this um, uh, justification uh, or is this a type of uh, um, a segregation, a kind of separating in the mind? Yes, this is called departmentalization, where this side you say is okay, but this side does not become okay. It's departmentalization. Uh, we do it, we hope we don't do it with people. Uh, those are very, very good questions. Please give us some more questions as we gather together on, uh, on next week, uh, same time, three o'clock central, four o'clock on the Eastern time. Let's look at the lesson that we have today uh, and what we have to talk about. Uh, we're gonna be talking about again, what is race uh, and its impact uh, on who we are today. Um, and race is still trying to redefine us. It's trying to say that we're separate. It's still trying to say we're different. It's still trying to mar or alter the image that God has created us in. We were all created in the image of God. We are all created like God. In previous uh, lessons, we talked about how we're 99.9% .9 exactly alike. So whatever tries to change who we are, we want to fight against that because we don't want to be, we don't want what God has created to be redefined. This is what God tells Peter. He, uh, a, he shows Peter a napkin coming down from the clouds and as it's coming down, there's animals that are on it. And he tells Peter, he said, what I have made clean, you're not allowed to call unclean. Now it really wasn't about the animals at all and the clean or uncleanness of the animals. It was really about him dealing with the Gentile people and telling Peter that Gentiles is what God has declared as being clean. In other words, God has put people on the same platform together. Let us not call unclean what God has already declared to be clean. Oh God, we give you some glory, we give you some praise, and we desire to be much more like you have called us to be. Today we wanna to deal with the issue of history as we go into uh, our discussion about race and our discussion about the divinity 
of how God has created us and what God has done for us. And so let's look at race. Go there with me just for a moment. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's begin in uh, 1787, as we go back to come forward in the beginning of the country, as we go back to the beginning uh, in 1787. 1787 to 1790. Uh, in 1787, the, uh, the, the uh, states got together and they declared that we were going to be, um, that uh, uh, the people who are of African descent, the slaves, we're going to be counted as three fourths of a human. Three fourths of a human. Uh, three fifths. I'm sorry. Three fifths of a human. And the 1790 Congress, when they actually did gather together, it was implemented and carried out, so that the South had more representation. What the South wanted was a counting of the people that were from the of the slaves were from the South, so they could have more representation in Congress. So they wanted a count of the slaves that were there. A compromise was struck. It's called the Three-Fifth Compromise. That compromise said that all whites could be counted as a whole person and blacks. Every five blacks would be counted as three slaves, I should say, from the South. Those three would help to represent a greater number in the Congress. Now, I want you to understand something about this. Uh, many people have said that meant that they only counted us as three-fifths of a person or a human. It's really worse than that. They really didn't count us as being a person or as being human at all. This was just the number to give representation in Congress so they could have a greater representation. It increased the number of representation in the South. Up to 45% of Congress became representatives from the South and gave the South a stronger hold on Congress when they were able to count slaves. But it didn't mean they thought you were three-fifths. It just meant that was the way they counted. They counted you a lot less than three-fifths of a human if you happen to be of African descent and being a slave. Now, as we move forward in this time that we have here um, and looking at what was going on, we get to the 1830s. Um, and in the 1830s, there's a, um, a thing that happens which called the Indian Removal Act. Uh, during the Indian Removal Act, it's a, a moment when uh, the United States declares that it's going to move uh, three large groups, three large Native American groups. They're going to move them from the south and the southeast, southwest, and southwest in particular, and they're going to move them across the United States so that it can get them out of land they've considered to be more precious and more valuable. Now let me tell you what the problem with this is. You've heard the term before, somebody has said to you that you are an Indian giver, right? And so that means that you give something and you take it back, it's not really real. Well, the Indians kept the treaties they made with America. The reality is that the Americans didn't keep the treaties they made with the Indians. We should call it the American giver, right? That's the person who will betray you or not do the right thing. Uh, in this sense, at this time, in 1830, it was the Americans breaking the treaty and not the Indians. And the Americans broke numerous treaties with the Indians. And when they did, um, you can see here on the map that they moved these tribes, huge nations, it was nations of Na Native Americans, and they moved in what would be called the Indian territories, isolating them and locking them in territories and uh, uh, moving them away from the regular public and took very precious property, very precious land from them when they did that. Now. Uh, what we want to understand is that American uh, used the Native Americans to take their property, take their land away from them. Um, this would be something, again, that God wouldn't be very pleased with. And so we always want to look at where our sins have been and where we can ask for a sense of forgiveness. Here it is a place that um, uh, these Native Americans are moved from their land and it has been taken from them and then they're being isolated in another place, in another property. Um, uh, many people uh, will recognize this particular move, move because it was also called the, the Trail of Tears. 
It's where the Native Americans actually died. So many of them died on this journey, uh, going from literally across state after state after state, walking until they died from exhaustion and from the lack of food and from drink. And so uh, this was a very terrible, very difficult time that had occurred and went on. It happened in the 1830s, and so we want to understand our history, and we want to understand how we've handled race and how we handle people that look different from us. Um, then I, I talked to you a little bit about this, so this won't seem too foreign to you, but I brought it back up to make sure that we could take a moment to take a look at it um, and, and see it again. Um, this gentleman's name is Dr. Morton. Dr. Morton was responsible for trying to put science into race, uh, and, and to try to clarify it greater, which had happened with Bloomberg and with Linnaeus. And so in 1843, he does a study on skulls and he determines from his own self-analysis that the skull will determine the size of the brain. He pre-believes that Europeans have larger heads. So he thinks that it's gonna turn out that Europeans are gonna be at the top of the calendar. When those numbers don't turn out exactly the way he wants them to, he actually ends up falsifying data and information. This is from the people that worked with him. However, that information that gets falsified is used to bring Texas in as a slave state. When Texas comes in as a slave state, this is what you need to understand. Um, it begins the, the continuation of the fall of the United States and the separation uh, of our civil war is set on course when this occurs. False data led to Texas being a slave state, which led to the civil war. And so we need to grasp that and understand that. But what he wanted to do was to show how there was an order of race, and that order of race was done by brain size, which had to do with the size of your cranium. None of this is true, and uh, the larger your head doesn't have anything to do with intelligence, right? So, um, so we do need to understand that. Now, let's come back to some of these God things that we're talking about right now, because we need to understand race and religion went together with each other, it was used inappropriately to justify people's thinking. And so here we have in 1845, the United States uh, begins to take on this particular thrust. It's called the Manifest Destiny. It, it is to say that the United States is going to move from the East Coast to the West Coast and is the destiny of God. It's divine. God has ordered us. It's our manifest destiny that God has told us that we're supposed to own all of this property, own all of this land. And while we go from one side to another, we are going to bring both technology, we're going to bring knowledge, we're going to bring morality, and we're going to bring God. And so we believe that we are the answers uh, for the world and that we're going to bring those things. Now I want you to look real close at the lady that's there floating in the air. She is called Columbia. She used to be the image, like Uncle Sam is the, the male image of the United States. Columbia was the female image of the United States before uh, the Statue of Liberty came along later. But this was the image used all the time of the United States coming forward until about 1920. As you see, she has a book in one hand for knowledge. She has the uh, telegraphic cord in the other hand for bringing technology. And you can see the train is behind her with, with ancient uses of transportation in front of her because she's bringing the manifest destiny. When she arrives, everything is gonna be better. And also, people will receive the morality of God when she arrived. So the United States saw itself as the godly arm, though they were producing and doing very terrible, ungodly things while they were going through this process. And so this happens in 1945. They declare they are the manifest destiny and the answer for the rest of the United States. And so they begin to wipe out and move out people, including Native Americans, and including annexing property that had to do with uh, um, Louisiana and also property from Mexico, like New Mexico, and bringing that property in because this was our manifest destiny to own from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from one end to the other. Now, um, 
as we continue looking through, we get to 1863. Now I want you to realize how close these times are. Um, we're believing that Manifest Destiny says that we're supposed to own all the property and all the land. Uh, at the same time that these things are going on, um, there's this decision going on about Texas coming in as a slave state, and there are decisions going on about the election that's going to happen. Uh, Abraham Lincoln gets elected as the president when he comes back in and, and uh, uh, as the president. This is a very scary event because people saw Abraham Lincoln as being an abolitionist, being against slavery. Though most of Abraham Lincoln's real position was to see slavery disappear probably at about 100 years, which means that I would have been born in 1960 as a slave. So he saw progressive, not progressive, but a very slow movement uh, over time of uh, slavery, a gradual, is the word I was looking for, a gradual uh, movement for people to come out of slavery. And so um, uh, understanding that, he was trying to protect the Union. He was trying to keep the Union together. The Union was scared that they were going to lose, uh, the South was scared they are going to use their right over slaves. And, um, and so uh, they were opposing uh, Lincoln's position. They voted for cessation, cessation and they to uh, remove themselves from the Union. And when they do, that starts the Battle of the Civil War. When the Battle of the Civil War occurs, a big fight between the North and the South, as we know, when that battle occurs and happens, um, it is initially trying to save the Union. But it's really all about slaves. That's the conversation. That's what's going on. So Lincoln uses the slave issue in the Emancipation Proclamation. When he declares the Emancipation Proclamation, he declares the freedom of all slaves in southern states that are in rebellion. That's what we need to really understand about the issues that go on with Emancipation Proclamation. When it, get issue, when it gets issued in 1863, it says, if you will come back in the Union, you can keep your slaves. But if you won't, then your slaves will be physically removed from you. But anybody who has slaves that's not part of a rebelling southern state, and there were some states that we had already taken possession of in the south, they could maintain and keep the slaves they had. So this was not the freedom of all slaves. It was the Emancipation Proclamation, January the 1st. Black still, uh, African-American churches still celebrate um, on uh, New Year's Eve, they'll still celebrate the time of Emancipation Proclamation on the January the first time, but it's not really the time that we get set free or that we feel a sense of freedom. The real freedom does not occur by Emancipation Proclamation. I'm sorry if that hurt somebody's feelings or if you saw Lincoln as a great emancipator and the great freer, uh, but uh, Lincoln was trying his very best to save the Union. As time went on, he became more and more an abolitionist um, and one who believed in the equality, more of the equality of blacks. One time when he's challenged in a uh, argument that he's having with a, uh, when he's running for a particular office, he's challenged with the issues uh, or the question of, do you believe that uh, blacks are equal? He said, I don't believe in slavery. However, I want to make it very clear that I do not believe that uh, the slaves are equal to white people. And this is him arguing at the time when he's running for office. So again, we do want to understand time and history so we understand what's going on. Much more closer to the end of his life, he becomes much more of a person who's given to the immediate uh, freedom and the release of slaves and does actions to allow that to occur. But that's not where he begins at, but I'm very glad about where he ended at. Um, this is the uh, statement, the amendment that really sets blacks free. So when you start looking at what sets slaves free, it's December 2nd, 1865. If you're learning something now, just say hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord. The 13th amendment is what sets us free in 1865. Uh, and this is what the amendment uh, virtually said, was that it outlawed slavery. And it said that you could not hold anybody else uh, in slavery going forward. That happens in 1865 and on December the 2nd. So it's a good two, almost three years later when this uh, occurs. But that's what that amendment stands for. And that's when all slaves 
uh, are, are declared at least legally to be free, though the freedom of slaves travels a little bit slower before everybody actually gets a chance to experience that freedom as, uh, as realizing we're, when we are celebrating Juneteenth Day, um, the last uh, moment when slaves are set free. Um, on this particular uh, amendment, I want you to understand something that it says, something that's written in this amendment. It says that there cannot be any kind of slavery uh, that can occur in the United States uh, except, and I want, you to, I want you to look at this word except, I'm going to go just to a minute back to that slide because I want you to look at it, except as a punishment for crime. Where if the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist. Uh, this established a loophole uh, for uh, the governmental powers. Uh, what it said was that you could no longer have slavery anywhere except using people in servitude if they were locked up in prison. Well, what did something like that mean? It then meant that uh, blacks were being picked up for, if you didn't have a job, you could be sent to jail. If you were standing on the corners, you could be sent to jail. If you were um, uh, performing any kind of task uh, that they felt was uh, inappropriate, not necessarily illegally, you could be sent to jail. So blacks were randomly getting locked up all over the country and particularly over the South, and they were being sent to jail. And then because the new slavery was in jail, you could now use those people as slavery on chain gangs and being used on plantations. Some people were actually returned to the same plantation that they were on as a, as a slave. They were sent back as now as a prisoner for, for some kind of nominal activity that nobody else was being arrested for. So it gave a loophole, the loophole of slavery, and we know what happens with slavery. And you can watch the movie called 13, or the documentary called 13, and it shows you what happens with the issues of slavery, uh, the issues of pri imprisonment. We had roughly, I think it was about 300,000 people that were in prison that rises to today closing in on 3 million people. You begin to lock people up because now you could get free labor out of them and you could lock them up and take them off the streets. Our prison rate is larger than any country in any industrial country in the world. And uh, we reestablished slavery even during the 18 and 1900s by utilizing prison is an outcome. Now, um, let, us, uh, let us take a look at uh, three very important particular amendments. They're all back to back. And so uh, since I've introduced the 13th, I wanna introduce the other three because this gives you an understanding of the trajectory of America so you understand what was happening. In 1865, the 13th Amendment is passed, getting rid of slavery and making it illegal, therefore it gets abolished. In 1868, the uh, 14th Amendment is passed that is allowing you to become a citizen and for uh, blacks uh, to be citizens. And so that, that, that happens in 1865. In 1870, we get the right to vote. So men, men get the right to vote. Uh, Native Americans uh, do not at the time. Women do not at the time, but uh, African American or uh, people of African descent that are male get the right to vote. Though it's really strange because remember, there's there's later fights for us to really establish ourselves as citizens and to really establish ourselves for the issues of the vote to reestablish those as late as into the 1960s. So we have to redo the very votes that we did, the Civil Rights Act, to redo the votes we did before. They were already in the amendment. We already had the right to vote, but they were oppressing voting so heavily that they had to establish uh, uh, again an act to affirm the 15th Amendment. Those three amendments you need to know. You need to know them by heart. Doesn't matter whether you're black, white, green, or yellow. You need to know those amendments because they are statements of freedom and they're statements that allow for the equality of man. And so you need to understand what God was doing um, and how God was equipping us to be free and what was happening in our nation and what was going on. Now, uh, we've talked about uh, race and we talked about some really important issues that are there and some things that are going on and some things that are happening in the amendments that I think you really need to know. 
I want to talk about just a few other things of importance to let you know about what was going on in the time. See, some people will tell you that literally slavery ended uh, at the time of the civil uh, at the time of the civil war. So why do we still have problems? Well, let me let me explain to you why problems continue to persist even with people who are attending churches even with people who are godly, even with ministers who were uh, preaching from the pulpit, the problems still continue to exist, and this is how they implemented it, even though the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment have been passed. I want you to take a look at this with me. These are called black codes. Black codes precede the Joe, uh, Jim Crow laws that were established, and they come into play, guess what? at 1865. The same time that slavery ends, people, the states begin to implement what is called black codes. Black codes limited the freedom in the movement of African Americans. So a reaction to reconstruction, a reaction to the empowerment for blacks to vote, for blacks to become whole offices as they did, the reaction of that was the black codes. The black codes prohibited blacks in certain states from owning property, from owning guns, from having jobs, from voting, and, and it allowed for blacks to be arrested if they didn't have a job. So these were the black codes that came about to restate slavery without it being slavery again. Now I want you to know something else that to happen in, in, uh, in 1865 that also retro uh, brought retro action to the freedom of slavery. If we would have allowed Reconstruction, a time where they allowed for freedom to occur for slaves, we would have been light years ahead of ourselves by now, but we don't end up being light years ahead. Why? Because uh, there's a reaction to reinstitute as close to slavery as we possibly can. So what becomes next? You know what it is. Here it is, the Ku Klux Klan. Ku Klux Klan was created in 1865 to make sure that um, uh, blacks stay in their place and to make sure that they operated um, in a way that, that, that whites found as being acceptable. Um, this was a secret organization. Uh, the, the identities uh, were held to be secret at first because, and it was a religious organization. They burnt crosses because they believed in Jesus Christ. And so the, the Klan was created. Now, it was created in Tennessee, uh, in Pulaski, Tennessee. Um, and so uh, just simply want to let you know that it was uh, the Klan was created in Tennessee itself. And so uh, that's something uh, for us to understand. But the Klan was created uh, as an organization that grew to four million people. Um, uh, to make sure that it uh, responded to the slave um, uh, freedom of the slaves that were going on. Now, uh, I'm I'm uh, I, I'm sorry um, um, uh, that we don't fully know and we don't fully understand um, that when slavery was over, that didn't end the oppression of blacks. Um, the Ku Klux Klan hung people. Uh, they was called lynching. Many of the Ku Klux Klan belong to the police, belong to law enforcement. That's why African Americans are, are, are people of African descent are still uh, suspicious uh, about um, uh, people who are in law enforcement because the uh, Ku Klux Klan infiltrated the law, law enforcement. They were sheriffs. They were the highest ranking people that were involved in that particular process that was there. So uh, I just want us to, to really deeply understand that some of these feelings we have and emotions that we have today come out of a deep rooted history with the past. Uh, Route 66 was the most famous way to get from Chicago to get to California before the highway system was put in place. And on Route 66, most of the cities that were there were called sundown cities meaning that you could not be there if you were if you were African, of African descent, if you were a person of color. You could not be on that highway and you certainly could not stay in its hotels or go to its restaurants. Uh, this was constant uh, oppression and the Klan overlooked this oppression and, um, and so there wasn't that freedom uh, that was present. That gave way to what was called the Green Book. The Green Book comes uh, 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 just uh, be at the turn of the century and stays in place for a decade. It's a book that told black people where they could go. It was green. It told you where you could go, where you could eat, and where you could be. Because if you're in the wrong place, you could be killed for being in the wrong place. Killed for being black. <clears throat> 
Um, that, that pushes us forward to a time which uh, some people are familiar with, and many of you all that are listening are. It's called the Jim Crow laws that were put in place. Um, and the Jim Crow laws um, uh, in 1876, and so the, the black code goes to the Jim Crow laws that are there. Uh, many states uh, adopt these laws, and uh, the name Jim Crow comes from uh, an actor who dressed in black face, and so he would put on uh, black polish onto his face, and he would act, and his name was Jumping Jim Crow. That was the name of the, the black person he would play as he played as an actor, and he called himself Jumping Jim Crow and made fun of the way that black people interacted and the way black people talked to each other. That's his real face there uh, on the other side, um, and uh, uh, that's, uh, that's who he was but um, uh, he would dress in blackface. That's why blackface is so offensive. It was to make fun of, to make jokes of blacks. And Jim Crow, they used this uh, person uh, that was president, they used him to talk about um, uh, the Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws, laws against black people. And so that's what's established there. Um, there's some things that I want to make sure that uh, we learn. I want you to catch that list that I just had up. There's some things I want you to learn, there's some things I want you to catch, and so I don't want them to, uh, uh, to, uh, to drift away that's there. And there's, there's three things. First of all, I want us to learn information so we become better at reacting to the issues of uh, race. I want us to listen um, uh, to uh, people who are talking about uh, a, a race issue so we can hear the sensitivity in their stories. I want us to lead in a way that we become the church leading forward in the issues of race and I want us to liberate, set people free. We are called to be leaders of the right truth of God, to, to be liberators where people are in bondage and need justice. We're, we're, we are called to be lifelong learners about the things of God and we are also called to ensure that we are very good listeners, very good listeners. I want to make sure that you are doing just that. Now, uh, I want to let you know that the show in particular is brought to you, uh, the the way that we're able to do the technology, the switching, and, and uh, the way that I can look at you at this camera over here and take another look at you at this camera here and take a look at you at the camera in front or, or switch back to, to uh, my presentation here is because um, Short Global Media Productions has established this um, the studio for me here. Uh, they do an excellent job. You need a studio. You need to get your message out. You need to get it heard. SGMP will help you to do that. Uh, if they can set a studio up for you in just one day. Just one day. They can have a studio ready to go. You have a studio just like mine. In just one day and ready to go. Um, so from your cell phone to your studio, you can go to being able to do that from your cell phone and go right to you having a studio and uh, be present, be out there in uh, YouTube, be out there in uh, Instagram, uh, have a presence in Facebook and have those things that are, that, that are there. But you need to contact Short uh, Global uh, Ministries to be able to, uh, to, to be able to Short Global Media Ministries. Now, um, if you do need, you, I, you're going to need, you're going to need to get in contact with them. So to get in contact with them, uh, you can contact them at this telephone number and of course that particular email address, talvin89 at gmail.com, talvin89 at gmail.com. Also, he has three packages to pick from. You may need just the professional package. Uh, you may be looking at um, the professional deluxe and you may be looking at the professional ultimate package. He's able to do all that for you for a very nominal cost and be able to pull those things together uh, for you. Um, again, this has been a very uh, encouraging time that we've spent together. I, I hope that you've learned. I have hope that you've grown. And I want to make sure that, um, that uh, this has been a time for you to, uh, to look into the image of God and see people as God wants them seen. And so, um, and I know that this show has probably also raised some questions for you. And so I want you to send those questions in. We will gather them together and we will answer those questions at the top of the show next week and give you answers to um, those particular questions that are out there. I wanna, uh, I, I wanna make sure that we close, we open with a word of prayer. 
blessing you and blessing that your mind would be open. I want to make sure that we close with a word of prayer and, uh, uh, and, and close and pray for everybody. And uh, I want to make sure that you can also send in, when you send in your um, uh, questions, you can also send in prayer requests. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to intercede with you. And so during this time of prayer, when I close out, I will also pray for you. So let's, let's pray together and ask for God's blessings. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray and ask for the blessings of the people that are out there. COVID, COVID is still present. Racism is still, racism is still happening. Churches are still struggling with their redefinition. Pastors are still looking for answers. Members are still undergoing stress levels that are way too high. God, there are things going on in our society that are complicating the world right now. The election is coming up. We believe Jesus is coming back. God, there's a, a meeting of all these pressures that are happening, but we know this one thing, that you have come to provide for us not only peace, but you're coming back for us. And so God, we rest knowing that you're going to return and that you're coming back for us. So God, we deliver all things in your hand and we rest in you in Jesus' name. My name is Dr. Michael Reynolds. This has been Michael Reynolds' ministry that has come to you and asked for these blessings in your life. I will again be looking very forward to seeing you when? Seeing you next week, three o'clock central, four o'clock Eastern time. What is race and how is it impacting you?